Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements, in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. We are in the midst of a series. Uh, for those of you who can... can uh, uh, hear my voice but, but can't, can't see, uh, you're in the, the call-in feature. For those of you who are streaming, uh, for those of you who are watching this at a later time, for those of you this is your first time, uh, I know uh, of at least two people uh, that, that said I didn't even know your church was, was streaming services, I'll be there with you on Wednesday night. <coughs> so greetings, glad you are. Please keep in touch with us. Let us know. Uh, we'll get, get you and your family's name uh, on the list of people that we pray for. I've got a prayer team that helps me, uh, and we'll, we'll pray for you. Let us know how, how we might do that. We're in the midst of a series called Battles in the Bible, uh, and we found out there's a fair number of them. And the first one that we have record of, remember, was in Revelation chapter... Where? 12, chapter 12 of Revelation, there was war in heaven. Now, there wasn't a disagreement in heaven. There was an argument in heaven. There was war. There was an assault of about a third of the angelic beings led by one named Lucifer to absolutely topple the governments that are established even in heaven and the structure of authority even that exists in the heavens and to exalt oneself, Lucifer, to be like the Most High. Uh, it didn't work. Our Bible says in, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, that there was war in heaven. Lucifer and his angels fought, and Michael and his angels fought, and there was no place found for Lucifer again in heaven. Jesus referenced it in Luke chapter 10, when he said, I saw Satan fall out of heaven. In other words, I was there. I was there when he came tumbling out of heaven and right to the earth. Uh, and that's verified for us in the books of Ezekiel and the books of Isaiah. That's verified for us that uh, he, he, was, he was thrown out of heaven to the earth. The Bible says he walks about the earth knowing that his time is short. This is not his final destination. His final destination, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, is the lake of fire where he will spend forever and ever and ever. I don't know why people fight that doctrine so and come up with their own man-made doctrines of demons and lies because somehow they, 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 they just can't take the Bible and read it and agree with it and embrace it and proclaim it. And so they proclaim some twisted doctrine that might be a little more palatable for them. That, well, really, Lucifer is just going to go there, and it's going to be kind of like the timeout chair. And once he learns his lesson, then he'll be released because God is merciful, and God always gives everybody a second chance. Uh, you need to read your Bible very carefully. Your Bible says he will be pitched into the lake of fire where the beast and false prophet are, and there he will spend eternity. He'll be there forever. You forgot when you talk about the gracious God that he's also the just God. And as far as giving a second chance, at the beginning of chapter 19, excuse me, at the beginning of chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, Lucifer is pitched into the bottomless pit where he's incarcerated for a thousand years. Now think about this. You're thrown out of heaven, and you spend at least 6,000 years on planet Earth. And that's part of his punishment. He's not in the presence of God anymore. He's not, he's not in the heavenlies anymore. He's not leading the heavenly choirs anymore. He apparently cannot transport like other angels can, because every time we have record of it in the Bible, it says Lucifer is walking to and fro across the face of the earth. 
Now, one pretty popular minister said that's because he doesn't have a car, doesn't believe in the prosperity gospel. <clears throat> but, but nonetheless, uh, book of Job, chapter 1, Satan, wh wh where have you been? Walking to and fro across the face of the earth. All the way back to 1 Peter, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Yeah, he's incarcerated here. He can't leave here. He can't ascend into heaven like other angels can. He's got to stay right here. Sorry about some of your beliefs about there being uh, uh, other civilizations on other planets. He can't go to one. He doesn't get Jupiter time and Mars time and Pluto time and, and, and Venus time. No, he's stuck right here. Stuck on this planet right here. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Ephesians chapter 3 uh, tells us some of them. Uh, and, and the fact that he has, to, he has to be around people who now have authority over him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Humans, weaker than angels. What is man that you have paid any attention to him whatsoever? A little lower than the angels. Now he's got to look at imperfect beings, much weaker, much less gifted, who have right standing with God and have access to his throne, and will spend eternity in his presence. He's stuck here, I'm sorry. And then he'll be thrown in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Read your Bible, Revelation chapter 20. What happens when he's let out? Oh, he's learned his lesson, and he goes repentantly and gets on his knees. No, he doesn't learn anything. His nature will never change. Immediately upon being released from the bottomless pit... The abyss, the Bible calls it, immediately upon being released. And then he goes right out to deceive the nations and turns them against God and assaults the holy city. His nature hasn't changed one bit, never will. And, and, and he'll be taken and thrown into the lake of fire. This battle is not over. I've said all of that to say battles are not always short. They're not always convenient. They don't always run on my timetable. I want it to be, I want it to be a, a, a six-day war like it was in 1967 for the, for the nation of Israel. I can handle six days of warfare. We've been in Afghanistan for over 20 years. We've been out there in the Middle East since 1991 trying to clean up that mess, and it's still a mess. We could, be there, we, we could be there for a thousand years. Some of those places, their wars have been going on that long. But we don't have the stomach for that. We don't have the backbone for that. We don't have the perseverance for that. We want it to be short. We want it to be taken care of. We, want, we don't want COVID. We don't want to read the report on, the vaccine is coming out. How wonderful, the vaccine is coming out. And life should be back to normal by this time next year. <sighs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't. It's been so long already. Eight and a half months. Now we don't want it to keep going. We 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 want things to be nice and neat and confess three scriptures and say two prayers and have hands laid on us and our battle's over. This battle has been raging at least six thousand years between Lucifer and our God. It will, it will at least have another thousand years tacked onto it before it's over. Uh, and, and we're stuck in the middle of it. As has been every human. No, you have to set yourself for warfare. In the battles in the Bible, some are over quickly. Some aren't. Some give us the, the, the impression that it's going to take some time and some effort and some energy and some investment. It's going to take walking all the way around a city, some 20 miles all the way around the, the walls of Jericho to do that. And, and then, okay, come on, God, knock it down. We did what you asked. No, you didn't. Do it again tomorrow. And do it again the next day. And do it again the day after that. And do it again the day after that. And do it again the day after that. We did it six days in a row. What do you want us above us? We want you to do it seven times today. That means we'd have to get up early. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, will that be enough? No. 
after walking around the whole city six days and seven times the seventh day, now you have to shout with all of your might. Then the wall will fall down. Oh, thank goodness the battle's finally over. No, the battle just started. You have to charge every man forward and fight your way into the city and take the city and conquer the inhabitants of the city. Well, will it be over then? No, then you have to fight the temptation to take the gold and silver and the garments and all the things that are reserved from God there because it's the first. And then you have to fight selfishness and you have to fight ambition and you have to fight greed and you have to fight covetousness. You have to fight those things then. You still have to put God first. You still have to give God what's his. No, the battle isn't done. See, this is protracted. This is a protracted fight uh, and, and on many different fronts. And it takes physical exertion and it takes spiritual maturity and it takes focus, which is part of the mental realm. It takes perseverance and a persevering and persisting spirit and, and, and that's spiritual and mental and, 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 and emotional. Uh, and, and many times the battles that we face uh, they tax us on every level, and they tax us in every realm, and they tax us for far longer than we wish it would take. And so then we stand, and stand, and stand, and having done all to stand, we stand. That's what your Bible says about the armor of God, which I will be teaching a series on when we're finished with battles in the Bible. All right, what chapter have you opened to? 1 Samuel 17. We've, we, we, we discussed, uh, in, in, as a group, Samson, Saul, and David. Now, Samson was not a king. Uh, uh, Saul was a king. And, and David, of course, is anointed to be the king at this point. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we see the final rejection of Saul. He has Throughout the previous chapters, throughout chapters 13, 14, and 15, he's demonstrated and proved finally what the, the man of God, the prophet, the preacher goes up and tells him right straight up to his face, uh, you have disobeyed God. You've disobeyed him and, and uh, uh, he, is, he is now extracting the kingdom from you and giving rulership and authority and that prominent position of leadership to another who is better than you. That's what your Bible said. Yeah, he's better than you. We see that anointing in chapter 16 that all seven of Jesse's sons pass by. David's still out in the pasture. He's called in and verse 13 of 16, verse Samuel 16, 13, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. From that day forward, the anointing was upon him. Now we don't see him serving in that capacity for many, many, many chapters. And there were different battles throughout that time before that actually came to pass. So often, this is a battle that we all face. We know or we believe we know what the will of God to eventually be. And David could have been tripped up at any time during this journey that took a multitude of years to come to pass. Again, that perseverance and that patience that patience to wait it out. If, if it is the will of God, listen to me very carefully. It will come to pass. The will of God will come to pass. The will of God will be done. The plan of God will be consummated. And, and, and uh, uh, he didn't see it. I mean, the, the Spirit of God came upon him and the prophet right there in front of his whole family. And, and, and what happened? When he leaves his family to go serve Saul, they don't see him ever again. Until when? Until he goes to the cave of Adullam and his brethren and his whole household come down to him there. Uh, when they come to him, they know he's been anointed to be the king, but, but they see him running and hiding. They, they, see, they see him in Adullam the next time they see him. Okay, uh, After he went to serve Saul. Now prior to that, there's a battle. You see it in chapter 17, and most people know it. Most people, we're, we've gone through portions of it. 
Goliath would come out, and it tells all about his height and how, how large he was and all of his armor. And, and, and he would come out, and he would cry against the, the armies of the Israelites, and he would cry for someone to come out and, 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 and fight him. Uh, and, and finally, David, David went down, and, and he said, uh, I'll fight him. I'll fight him. Verse 32, he was taken to King Saul, and David said to Saul, Let no man's heart uh, fail him. Your servant will go fight uh, the Philistine. There are people who aren't afraid of a fight. I mean, there are people that kind of like it. And if you get to the point where, in faith, you already know what the outcome is going to be, uh, fights, uh, they're, they're not always bad. I know the outcome of this. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't like using myself as an example. I don't because people think of it as arrogance and you're you know, bragging and you're puffing yourself up. It has nothing, nothing to do with that. I know, I know our God. Yeah. I know our God. And, and, and just personally, uh, I had two serious car accidents. Paula was with, with me in one of them. Uh, my younger brother was with me uh, in another. And I had two serious car accidents in 1980. Uh, uh, less than three months apart, was rear-ended both times. One time I was waiting to come into Sunday night service at church. And if you think about coming down Ward Avenue, and you come down Ward Avenue, and then there's a whole line of, of four, five, six cars waiting to turn in, what are you going to do? You're going you're gonna to put your brakes on and put the signal on. And, and they were turning in slowly, going into the church service, and, and I was at a complete stop, and a young man hit us going 70 miles an hour. Seven it hit us so hard it broke the bucket seat loose from the bolts that held it to the floor of the car. Uh, and, and less than three months later, I just, 1972 Fastback Mustang. Just got it all, the paint job done, the stripe kit came in, we got it all fixed and all done. And, and Paul and I went on a date. We were dating. Uh, and, and, and we went up to Apple River and did an inner tubing thing. We pulled out of Apple River, went a short distance to where it was. there was a lift bridge, and it was up, and we stopped behind about 15 cars, and you know what sound I heard behind us? The squealing of tires, and I thought, not again. I just got my Mustang painted and fixed and back. And wham, that, that girl ran right into the back of us. She had kids in the back seat. She was turned around talking to them like this, turned around, and there we were. And, and slammed right in the back of us. Uh, and, and, and I had some serious long-term, I was told lifetime injuries. You never get over them, never get past them. Uh, and, and I didn't know 1 Peter 2.24 existed in the Bible. I didn't know Mark 16.18 was anywhere in the Bible. I didn't know what Isaiah 53 said. Didn't have any clue that Exodus said, uh, in chapter 15, verse 26, I am the Lord that healeth. I didn't know that. I didn't know any of that. But in the next two to three years, I found out all of that. And, and I, I met a God who not only saves, I met a God that baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I met a God that heals. That heals everything. Heals every disease and every sickness among the people. That's the Lord that, that, that I got acquainted with there. And, and, and so fast forward now from 1983-84, fast forward to 2006. 2006, Paul and I were on a, a motorcycle that we had at that time. It was a nice motorcycle, too. I mean, Honda Nighthawk 750. I mean, that was just so smooth. And, and we were coming back from Winona, Minnesota. Went up there, did a little shopping on our way back. And a young lady pulled out, and she came the wrong way in the four lane. And, and, and I had a choice. Swerve to the right. I'm going to hit that car. I've got about a, maybe a quarter of a second to make the decision. Stay where I'm at. I'm going to hit her head on right in between her lights or I'm going to swerve to the left, and I don't think we can miss her. And, and, and we, 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 I leaned hard to the left, fully braking, and the, and, and the tires of the bike were still going to hit her. And some unseen force moved the tires of that bike. I was all the way leaning like this, fully braked, and the tires went over here, and we passed her with our head, six inches from our helmet, and then went down and crashed and smashed uh, and, 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 and had some very significant, very serious injuries and, and took, took surgical procedures that lasted for the next five years. 
I wasn't out of surgeries until 2011. And, and, and was in a lot of pain and, and a lot of agonizing, got a lot of bad reports uh, about this won't heal and that won't heal. And, 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 and I laughed my whole way through. Because I met him back in 1983. And I already know what the end of this is going to be. You can say what you want. I, I, I met it all with a smile. And, 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 and never, ever, ever, even not one single even moment got discouraged. It was painful. It was agonizing. It hurt. Uh, I didn't enjoy it. Uh, I didn't like it. I hope I never go through anything like it again. Uh, uh, but, but I knew the outcome. I knew the outcome before it started. And when they said, you will never, ever, ever, ever get any more than 70% strength out of, that, out of that arm, and you'll never get more than 70% mobility out of that right shoulder and out of that right arm, you can't. You can't. We cut your collarbone off. We cut the shoulder blade off. We, 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 we put, a, we put a, uh, an anchor in the back and sutured everything and put you in a sling for 16 weeks that you couldn't move out of and then put you on a table and turned that arm over and jumped up in the air and came down on that and, and, and broke it loose. You'll, you'll never get that. And I just, I, I didn't disagree with them. I didn't make my big faith confession to them. I don't make my faith confession to hardly anybody. I don't, I don't, I don't say what I say to be heard from people. Learn something from that. There is a God in Israel. There's a God in, in, in La Crosse, Wisconsin. There's a God in the heavens, and, and I'm about talking to him. He's my help. You're not. Yeah, he's, he's, my, he's your help. I'm not. He's your sustainer. He's your strength. He's your healer. He's your provider. He's your all in all. He's your shepherd. He's your peace. He's your defender. He's your high tower. He's a rock of your salvation. He's the one you'll stand before. He's the one who bore your sin in his own body on the tree. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ. He's son of the living God. He's king of kings and Lord of lords. And I just talked to him about it. And then I'd smile because I knew what the outcome was going to be. When you fight battles, and you know, it's, it, that doesn't mean it's easy. The right. most difficult thing you've ever been through in your life, emotionally, mentally, physically, financially. And, and, and I'm telling you what, we came out of that thing financially smelling like a rose. Could have been better. Could have been a whole lot worse. A whole lot. Because when, when, when she's got $100,000 worth of surgeries or, or worth of insurance, and you max it out, and they're telling you you're going to have $350,000 worth of bills for surgeries, and you come out not owing a dime and actually profiting from it? Somebody was on the job. Somebody was working on your behalf. Uh, and and, and we, we, we came out of that owing nothing, not, not, not a dime, and with money in our pocket. Pretty good bunch. Uh-huh. God will help you. But you have to talk to him. You have to mean business. You have to live for him. You can't wait till it starts and wait till it happens. You have to already be walking with him. And, and you can know the outcome. Five years of surgeries, seven years of rehab, three different kinds of, 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 of prescribed medication and, and, and painkillers and things. Didn't have, didn't have more than two hours sleep for seven months after that happened before they even give me anything. Wouldn't even touch me for months. I had, I had a great big blood clot underneath my pectoral muscle on this side, covered my whole rib cage. Great big size of a big pancake underneath it. Every rib on this side, either broken or cracked or displaced, every one of them. And, and, and I, I knew what the outcome was going to be. It took a long time, and I'm trying to express that with you. It's not quick, it's not easy, it's not fun, it's not pain free. Just because God's working on your behalf doesn't mean you're going to get the genie uh, trick and, 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 and rub it and you get your wish. Snap your finger and wave the magic wand. No, battle is painful and, and, and it's costly and, and it's, it's not enjoyable and it's not fun. But I knew what the outcome would be. And I remember when I went in that day and they said, you got 100% strength and 100% mobility in, 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 in that arm. You must have been working. Uh, well, I, I did. I mean, I did all my, where's my physical therapist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did all my exercises at home and did my, yeah, did everything I was supposed to and all of that. But, but boy, you know, when I was telling the story to somebody today, you know, when they said, You'll, there's so many things you're never going to be able to do again. And Paul and I went bowling one night. And it was like 2012. 
and, and, and I mean, I, I'm in trepidation. I don't know what's going to happen. I walked over. I picked out the littlest little girl, pink, four-pound bowling ball you've ever seen. Little tiny. It's like, I hope nobody's watching me. No, I don't care. I'm going to go up there to that line, and I'm going to bowl. Not foolishly. Not foolishly. It's been a lot of years since, and, 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 and I'm feeling good, and I can do things again. And I went up there, and boy, sweat started pouring out. You say what you want. I don't care what you think about it, whether it's fear or doubt. I don't know. It was sweat. <laughs> Beads of it. I got this little pink ball. <laughs> and boy, I just, I kind of, I mean, no, no flowing form, you know, anything. None, none of that stuff. <laughs> no, I didn't do this. Okay, no, I didn't do that underhand, for those of you now... And, and, and it just went like that, and nothing popped, nothing snapped, nothing cracked. I turned around and went, yes! And there was a guy sitting there, he said, dude, you got a four. <laughs> he didn't know. He didn't know. Since then, I mean, I could take that 16-pound ball or whatever it is and, and bowl two or three games and, and enjoy it and have fun. Uh, and and uh, I hate that I had to go through that. But I never got angry at the woman. She was in the wrong place. She was in the wrong lane. She was in the wrong direction. She was 100% at fault. I should not have had to smash my bike up and crash it. And my wife had broken bones and skin abrasions and and, and me all that. We we shouldn't have had to go through that. But I never, ever let uh, bitterness. I never let anger. I never put my mouth on her, not even one time. I, I never got out of love. I never blamed her for the way I was feeling and everything I had to go through. Matter of fact, I didn't blame anybody. I didn't blame the devil. I didn't, I, 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 he didn't run me off the road. Give him credit for something he didn't have anything to do with. Why would I do that? Glorify the devil and tell everybody, he tried to take me out. No, he didn't try anything. A, a, a person got confused. She got confused, didn't know where she was. She thought she was on a two-lane road instead of a four. And, and she pulled out and turned north like you would on a two-lane road. Hmm? Now, stay in love and stay in faith. I said, stay in love and stay in faith and stay in the battle. Amen. 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 Now, <coughs> are there times when you get tired in the battle? Yes, there are. There are times you depend on your Christian brothers, your Christian sisters, your minister, your pastor. There, there, there are times that you, in agreement in prayer, that's so if one of you starts to lag down, the other one comes alongside and holds you up straight. Amen. That's what agreement is all about. Yes, the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man is effective and powerful. Yes, that's exactly right. But if two of you on earth agree concerning anything they ask, it shall be done of my Father which is in heaven. There are times that we're, we're not intended to face every battle by ourselves. Now, now, since we're right along that line, hold your place there and turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 10. 2 Samuel chapter 10. It's appropriate and and applicable. It's one of the battles that we're going to look at eventually anyway. (laughs) This is just a great battle right here. 2 Samuel 10, it actually actually is found also in in the Chronicles. In in the Chronicles, this uh, this same battle is described. And and, uh, you find that very often in in 1 Samuel, 1 Kings, 1 and 2 Samuel. Chronicles, you'll find these these repeated. All right, are you with me? All right. Verse 7, ready? Verse 7. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out, and they put the battle in array at the entry in of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and of Rehob and Ishtab and Maacah were by themselves in the field. And Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind. Then he chose all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother. Better underline his brother right there that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. See, this is one battle, but there are 
multiple enemies. You might write that down in your notes. One battle, multiple enemies. Sometimes there's physical enemies, financial enemies, emotional enemies, mental enemies. Sometimes there's a, a number of, of spiritual enemies. So one battle, multiple enemies, and he and his brother were in this battle together. The rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, here we go, verse 11. And he said, if the Syrians be too strong for me, then you help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for you, then I will come and help you. This is the way you ought to fight battles with your brother, with your sister with the people who stand beside you. This is the way battles should be fought when there are multiple enemies or even multiple battles. You don't have to face everything by yourself. You weren't intended to win every battle on your own. And, and, and so often we looked at it on Sunday with Elijah, he's fighting this mental warfare. He thinks he's all alone and by himself, and he's the last of the last, and he runs and hides in a cave, and, and, and the Lord calls him out and says, what are you doing in here? He says, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just the only one left. You're not supposed to be in a cave thinking you're the only one left. You're not. There are resources available to help you, many of them humans. Well, I don't want them to know that I'm struggling. I thought we just had three services on pride. And, 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 and shall we just be real here? You don't want them to know you're struggling, but they don't want you to know that they're struggling too. Life is life for everyone. And, and if you can get through it on your own, you don't need others to, uh, to, to, to stand there with you. You don't need anybody else, or you, you just need that one other person. You don't need to announce it to the whole world and, and, and get a thousand people praying for you. Jesus said, if two of you, if two of you, if two of you. Now, some of you are going to think this is, this is a Mark Clement's testimony night. I didn't intend to tell you any of this. Didn't tell, didn't tell any of this. Uh, I was in just for my annual checkup. This was, what, what's it been? It's been quite a few years ago now. Because I remember the five, I think it was like 2013, and, and went in. Uh, and, and, and the doctor said, how do you feel? Da, 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 da. I feel great. Everything's good. He said, he said what is that on, what, what is that right there? What, 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 what's that on your nose? I said, I don't, I don't know, pimple. And he looked at it and he said, I don't think that's a pimple. He said, I want to do a bi biopsy on that. I said, well, I, okay, if you want to, go ahead. So he did a biopsy. Uh, and I remember the day, if you've never received a phone call, when they use the C word, that's cancer. Uh, it, that's, uh, I don't know, it just has some, some meaning that no other word in the English language has. And I remember the, the, the young lady who, who made the phone call, and she said, is this Mark Clements? Yes. Uh, um, um, are you at a place where you can talk? I said, I'm standing in my house. Yeah, go ahead. W what is it? Well, we've got the results here, biopsy back, and it isn't good news. I said, well, just tell me what you have. And she said, you have cancer. I said, uh, anything else? She said, well, they'd like to start a... a, a uh, a plan for how it's going to be treated. Um, I said, okay. Uh, she said, we need to make an appointment and you need to come in. And she described the whole long procedure of what would take place. Uh, and she said, we'd like to get you in right away. I said, okay, what's right away? I'm thinking like tomorrow. And she said, well, the first appointment we have is six weeks. I said, okay, all right, uh, that's fine. She said, that's fine? I said, yeah, that's fine. That'll give me time to put my faith on this. That's what I told her. And she said, <clears throat> this is what she said, about the way she said it too. She said, I don't even know who she is. I'm not criticizing her. I'm just telling you this is what happened. She said, <clears throat> Mr. Clements, 
you need to take this seriously. I said, ma'am, you have absolutely no idea about how seriously I'm about to take this. Uh, and, and so she, she said, we'll call you back with an appointment, and, and, and they did, and gave me the date and things like that. I made one phone call. I didn't make 10. I didn't make 100. I didn't make 1,000. You might do differently. I'm not going to criticize you. I hope you don't criticize me and get in sin and have to repent later. I made one phone call. And you think I preach it? And ain't gonna, I'm not going to live it? I called my pastor. I didn't even talk to my wife. I didn't talk to her for two and a half weeks. I didn't have to. I surely didn't come here and stand up and talk about it. I made the call I needed to make. I said, I'd like you to agree in prayer with me. This is what is going to happen. I'm going to go in there in six weeks. And they tell me that that biopsy showed cancer on all four edges of the skin sample and completely to the depth of the skin sample so it was spreading in every direction and deep. And when I go in for that biopsy, they are not going to find one single solitary living cell of cancer in my body. He said, I am in total agreement with that. We prayed and it was done. It was, done. It was absolutely done. For the next three and a half weeks, I didn't sleep a wink. I couldn't digest my food. Oh, baloney. I slept like a baby, and I ate everything I wanted to. I knew, I knew the outcome. I knew, I knew exactly what the outcome would be. And I went in that day, and, and they took this big white thing, put it over my face, and they, they did their, they took the sample. And, and they, they said, we'll be back in about 10 or 15 minutes. 10 or 15 minutes went by, and man, I'm looking out from under the sheet. 25 minutes went by, and I look up my sheet. 40 minutes went by, and finally somebody came back in the room. I'm just telling you the way it happened. I'm telling you battles are real, and everybody fights battles. And, 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 and how many of you have never heard this story? Some of you, okay, all right. You want to hear it or you want me to quit? Yeah. Huh? 40 minutes later, they came back in, and they, uh, I said, I said, they said, um, um, something is wrong. I said, what's wrong? You didn't find any, did you? I said, well, I'm not authorized to say, but we're bringing another pathologist in to come look at the sample. I said, how long is this going to take? Should take another 15 minutes. So that took another 25 minutes. And then they came in and they said, there's just something wrong. <clears throat> We've got your previous sample, and it shows cancer cells all the way around the biopsy and to the full depth of the biopsy. And this is not even possible. I said, it is. There's no, there's no cancer there. Get as many people as you want to look at it. You're not going to find any. And, and, and see, by now I'm getting... I, I was that way before. Think what you want. I knew what the outcome would be before, the battle, before it ever even started. That was just part of the battle. See, the battle is the mental warfare all along to stay in faith out of fear. Stay in belief, out of unbelief. That's the mental part of the battle. The whole way, believe that God meant what he said, said what he meant, is the God of the eternities, watches over his word to perform it, and not one word he has ever spoken is going to return to him void. Not feeling sorry for yourself because of your current predicament or, or, or condition and think, why am I being so attacked and why would this ever happen to me? And I serve God and I'm a tither and why would this? I said a few weeks ago, uh, doesn't say anything about us not getting sick. We don't stay sick. Our Bible tells me. I took communion tonight before I came out here and I said, you said in your word that you'd bless what I eat and what I drink. This applies. Exodus 23, 25, you, if I serve you, you will bless what I eat and what I drink. You will drive sickness out of the midst of me. How can that scripture be in the Bible if it's never going to be there? Drive it out. Drive it out. Drive it out of the midst of me. Fulfill the number of my days. And, and, and finally, they brought three different people in to look at that sample. And then they came in and said, we can't find it. Not even, this is what they said, there's not even one living cancer cell anywhere, anywhere in, in, in the skin that we just took. But we're going we're gonna to cauterize it anyway because we know it's there. <laughs> I said, you know what? I don't even know what that means, but if that'll make you feel better. <laughs> so I told them, I just, 
and, and, and it's gone, and then you had to go back about a year, and go back after two years, and go back after three years, and go back after four years, and then the fifth year, they said, don't come back anymore. I said, uh, okay, 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 okay. After about two and a half weeks, I told Paula, and, and I said, uh, you know that thing they, they biopsied on my nose? Uh, uh, um, I did get a call on that a few weeks back, and, and they said, it is cancer. But I'm going in in about four weeks, and they're not going to find one living cell anywhere in my body. And I mean, she just she didn't she didn't get tears in her eyes. She didn't quiver her little none of that. She stepped forward. She she came at me. She did. I mean it. We were in our kitchen. I can tell you right where she was standing, right where I was standing. When I told her, she came at me. She said, "That's exactly right. That's exactly what they're not going to find." Ma'am, the kind of woman you want to be married to, amen. That's going to stand in the stand in the teeth of the battle and not wilt. And 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 see, see that, that's that's the way David is. Let's finish up with with Abishai and 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 Joab here uh, in Second Samuel uh, chapter eleven. Then we'll get back to David not wilting. I mean, I mean, he 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 went after him. He went after him. So so Second Samuel ten. And he says, uh, if, 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 if the Syrians, the ones that I'm facing, if they're too strong for me, then you come help me. You know what that means? That means, now listen real carefully here. That means Abishai has to forget about his own battle for a few moments. You listening to me over there in, in, in overflow? You haven't stopped streaming yet, have you? you huh? huh? That means he had, to, he, had to, he had to forget about his own fight for a while. He had to turn his back on the enemies he was facing for a while because Joab is over here fighting the Syrians. And he said, if they get to and, 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 and Abishai is over here opposite direction, they're fighting back to back. And you're, you, you take care of them and you take care of them. But if, if they start to overwhelm you and overcome you, then I'm going to come help you. That means I have to fight. I have to leave my fight for a while. I can't focus on what they tell me is, is growing in my body. I can't focus on pain and, 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 and surgeries. And i got to come here and help you through yours. There are times that you just have to, just, just have to say, you know what? I'm, gonna turn, I'm just going to forget about my battle and don't be self-centered, self-focused, and selfish. I'm just not going to do that for a while. I'm going to pray for everyone's finances in my church. I'm going to pray for other people's. And when you do that, it comes back to you on every wave. When you give that, it comes back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over into your life. When you lift up other people, you turn around and, and wow, the Lord fought my battle for me. He said, <coughs> if, if they start overwhelming you, I'm going to come to your aid. And, and if they start overwhelming you, then I'm going to come to your aid. You see that? I said, do you see that in your Bible? Yes. We don't leave anybody alone. Well, too bad for them. If they'd have fought it right, if they'd have stood in faith, if they really would have given with a pure heart, if they were really a worshiper, they wouldn't be losing the battle. Oh, that's not what our Bible teaches. Our Bible teaches, turn my back on my battle and go help them in theirs. And if I start becoming overwhelmed, then what? (laughs) They come and help me. Great. Isn't this a great battle? All right, thank you for your enthusiasm. At midnight here in this formerly Pentecostal church. If the Syrians be too strong for you, you help me. If the children of Ammon be too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Some of that ought to be highlighted and underlined and a determination of your life. Verse 12, be of good courage. Let us play the men for our people <clears throat> and for the cities of our God and the Lord do that which seemeth good to him. See, we're going to jump in. We're going to do our best. We're going to give our, uh, our best effort. We're going to help each other. We're going to stand together and, and, and the Lord's will be done. Amen. And the Lord's will be done. Be of good courage. Let us be men for our people. Act like men for our people. Be leaders. Don't, 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 don't will. Uh, and, and for the cities of our God and the Lord do. In the margin of my Bible, it says, according to his will. That which seemeth good to him. That which seemeth good to him. All right. Uh, that's a great battle. That, that, that's one for the future. So I'm going to mark it off my list. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Yeah. 
All right, real quickly back to First uh, Samuel chapter 17, uh, and, and, and there's David, and, and no one else will leave the trenches. No one else will leave their protected area. No one else will leave uh, the, the, the comfort of being around uh, a large group of people. Uh, but this one young man, he can, he's not a soldier. He just hears this giant defying the armies of the living God. And he said, why don't somebody go take care of that? Why don't somebody go take care of that? His brother said, oh, you haughty little thing. Get out of here. We know you just came down here to watch the battle. Just, just, who's, who's taking care of those few sheep of yours anyway? He didn't get his feelings hurt in that. He just started considering. He just started pondering. He just started musing. He just started saying to Saul, you know, that we're not, this wasn't his fight. Goliath wasn't calling him out. This wasn't his battle. He, 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 just, he just went out there and he, and he said, uh, no, no reason for any man's heart. I'll, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of this. He didn't make a big deal about it. He, he didn't say, tell everybody, make sure all my brothers know I want them to be. No, he just said, I'll, I'll go deal with this. I'll, 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 I'll take care of this. I'll go take care of that Philistine. And so all the first thing the king said to him in verse 33 was, you can't do that. That's the kind of help you don't need. You are not able to go against the Philistine and fight with him. You're only a kid. He's a man of war from the time he was a youth. And David said, and he, and he rehearsed, that I watched my father's sheep and a lion and a bear came out, took a little lamb out of my flock and I went after him. See, that's what he's doing again. See, in the small battles, go after it. Yeah, go after it. Don't wait, till, don't wait till they call and use the C word. Go after it. Go after it. No matter what it is. Yeah, when it's small and, and took a lamb and I went out after him and I smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I talked about that on Sunday. Stupid bear, man. Somebody chases me all the way across the plane and, and batters my head hard enough for me to drop. I think I'm just going to keep running. Lick my wounds. And, no, he didn't do that. He rose up against him. And, and, and so did the lion. And I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. I see, I smote him before. Now I'm going to smote him and slay him. I'm not going to quit. And I slew the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, see, has no covenant with God. David's confidence was not in his ability it wasn't that, that he could say the right words or make the right confession. It wasn't about him. His whole confidence was in his God. This man is uncircumcised, and he'll be just like one of them, seeing he's defied the armies of the living God. And David said, see, he didn't stop talking. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And, David, and Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. And then they had the armor incident, and, and Saul tried to put his armor on there. Might have been a little selfish motive. He wanted people to think it was him walking out there. Nonetheless, uh, David couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't wear it. It didn't fit. He'd never, he'd never proved it in battle. And, and, and that's, again, just a great, great lesson. Verse 38, he armed him with his own armor, put a helmet of brass and armed him with a coat of mail and, and, and wrapped his sword around him and tried to go, but he had not proved it. And he said to Saul, I can't go with these. I've not proved them. And he took them off. And he took, underline that, his staff. He took his staff in his hand. And he chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, even in a script. And his, underline it again, which he had. And his, underline it, his sling. See? And that was in his hand. And he drew near. He didn't have to go shopping for weaponry. He already had it. He already had it. And it was what he was used to using before the battle with Goliath. He was used to using it. You have to get used to using the scriptures. You have to get used to using your prayer language. You have to get used to using perseverance. You have to get used to using worship. You, 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 you have to be used to using your sling and, 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 and your staff. 
You have to, you have to, you have to have already, you have to have already proved them when the giant shows up. Amen. All right, we're going to close for for tonight. I'm looking forward to uh, to Sunday uh, because we'll finish up this battle, and then there's two battles that we'll we'll look at on Sunday uh, uh, of David's. Uh, maybe three. Maybe three. Maybe three. Why? Uh, we we do have three of David's. Well, we've got four. We actually have four battles of David's left. Two with Saul, one at Ziklag, and the one he didn't go to. The battles of David. And uh, and when we're done with with David, well, well, we'll we'll see how far we get on Sunday. Let's all stand and our. Thank you for watching the Word of the Lord, a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.